Hello, I'm TJ and welcome to my garden. Listen along as we explore the art and science of gardening. You can leave feedback for the show at 661-368-5177 or visit our website at tjsgarden.com. Uh, for a lot of you, I know that this is nearing the end of your gardening year, and so it may seem an odd topic, uh, but here we're kind of in the middle of our fall gardening season here in California, so we're actually still growing them. Uh, today's topic is going to be tomatoes. I would like to kind of give a little bit of an overview and some history on tomatoes, uh, and then I will segue into a interview with Petrina Small and Craig LaHuyer. Uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with him, not as familiar with her, maybe. Uh, she's a little newer to gardening than he is, or rather, she hasn't published any books. So <laughs> she isn't as well known as the, the writer of Epic Tomatoes, which is the book I'll be talking about at the end of the episode. So I'm going to do a quick little review of his book after I talk to him and her. Uh, but they are respectively the American and Australian lead of the Dwarf Tomato Project, a project to make tomatoes kind of more conveniently sized to take a gene that's been known in tomatoes for a while but sort of sitting in the background and make many 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 varieties with that trait so we're going to talk a lot about that especially about the nature of dwarf tomatoes themselves a lot of the varieties they've worked with some of their issues uh coordinating the project but mostly it's going to be about the tomatoes today so stay tuned i got a good show going uh, let's get right into it Solanum lycopersicum, uh, formerly I believe Solanum, or I'm sorry, not Solanum, formerly I believe it was uh, Lycopersicum esculenta, I think it is, basically just, the, the word uh, Lycopersicum means wolf peach, weirdly enough, peach is persicum in Latin, and oddly that's because we got peaches through Persia, not because peaches are from Persia, so the word means Persian fruit, but the fruit isn't Persian, uh, naturally. So kind of fun, <laughs> kind of a complicated path. The wolf part refers to the fact that tomato plants are hairy. Um, when you look at a tomato plant, it's covered in little hairs. So that's where you get wolf peach. Uh, supposedly this was a popular name for tomatoes at one point. Uh, when I, when I look it up, the, the reference says known as the wolf peach or lycopersicum, uh, as far as I know, nobody's ever called it that, though. I, I've Googled, and all I can see are references to people saying that's what people used to say. I can never actually find a reference to that being said historically or being a common name or people just commonly saying, hey, look at those wolf peaches. So uh, take that with a grain of salt. I think Linnea just had a, Linnaeus just had a bit of a fun with it. Um, but it also kind of ties into something else I wanted to talk about, which was the supposedly deadly nature of tomatoes. And this is another kind of mythical thing people say about the past. Um, I've, I've looked this up several times, and I have yet to find very many good references for people historically saying tomatoes were poisonous. A lot of us say, well, you know, they used to think they were poisonous. That doesn't appear to be the case. Uh, every reference you can find... Uh, even back like Thomas Jefferson did this as well is you find these references way back when to people saying that way back when they thought they were poisonous and that just goes back and back further and further uh, everybody says it's their grandparents or you know and when you look at references from that time they also say it was their grandparents it all seems to go back to a handful of northern French German and English sources where they actually didn't say specifically that they were poison. They described them as being toxic or unwholesome or, un, you know, uh, just generally nasty. <laughs> um, and But weirdly, they would always acknowledge that the people in the tropics did eat these and that people in the Mediterranean were increasingly eating them after they were introduced to Europe. So I think what we have here is possibly in some cases a bit of class distinction, but in a lot of cases... It's just Northern Europeans did not like them. Um, now, that may be down to tomatoes not growing as well in their climates. Uh, even though nowadays you can get all kinds of varieties of tomatoes that can grow in fairly cool climates, we have the benefit of many, 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 many years of breeding 
between us and the Europeans who had them when they were first introduced. When they were first introduced, they were a crop from the tropics. So it may just have been that the tomatoes they could grow weren't that good or they weren't able to grow them very often. Uh, but they spread through the Mediterranean like wildfire and eventually became more popular in Northern Europe. And they became popular in Europe well before they became popular in the U.S. But even when they weren't very popular, they were widely grown as an ornamental. Uh, people found quite a bit of novelty in the shape of the flowers, the fur on them. I mean, it doesn't look that ornamental to us now. But if you think of a tomato fruit, we think they're pretty because we like them, right? We eat them. Uh, but to people who maybe have no interest in it as a food, it's still fairly attractive. They have these nice big red fruit. They have these little yellow flowers. The hairy stems are kind of a novelty. And so these were grown as an ornamental, even when people weren't necessarily that intent on eating them. Um, in America, it largely seems that people just didn't like them. When, when you see references, you, you know, you go back to Thomas Jefferson, he grew them and ate them. Uh, but in his time, there was actually a man who, as a public spectacle, ate a tomato and people couldn't believe it because they thought it was gross. They didn't think it tasted good. They thought it was disgusting. So a lot of it seems really be that historically it just took a while for people of European descent to develop a taste for tomatoes. Uh, eventually, the widespread introduction of tomato pastes and sauces and everything else from the Mediterranean into the U.S. with you know various waves of immigrants, that sort of thing, gradually around the time of the Civil War made it more uh, palatable to us, right? Americans started eating them and growing them to eat them. And many, many, many years later, in the late 1800s, they would eventually start actively breeding tomatoes. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit when I talk about when I do my review of Craig Lillier's Epic Tomatoes, but he actually has a section in there where he breaks down sort of the history as far as when they stopped just saving the best tomato and started looking at the plants themselves and made selections from the plants. Because the truth is, if you have a really good plant that's producing really good tomatoes and you save the crappiest tomato from that plant, it still has the same genetics as any other tomato. So you don't have to look for the best tomato. You just want to find the plant that produces the best tomatoes and save seed from that, whether you save it from a good fruit or not. Uh, and this was something that wasn't widely known historically. They used to make their selections based on the fruit. They would pick the best fruit. And you may have the one really, really good fruit on an otherwise unproductive or undesirable plant. Once they made this transition, that's when you really begin to see tomato breeding take off and the varieties increase. Uh, and then you get into what we call heirloom tomatoes now. And that is a very loaded term. Um, the general de definition, I think, is it goes back to, I want to say, 1940s, 1930s. Basically, a variety that predates... Uh, the, introdu the introduction, I'm sorry, of, I uh, can't talk today, the introduction of hybrid tomatoes. Once those hit the market and sort of took over, that's when you begin to see the end of the commercial varieties that were heirloom varieties that people kept and saved the seeds from. I have a somewhat narrower definition. To my mind, we use that term for a lot of things it isn't. Um, to me, Heirlooms are seeds that are saved and passed on generation to generation, not necessarily sold. <laughs> and, and I know that term's never going to catch on that way because it's already used as a marketing term by plant seed companies. And I have absolutely no ill will towards those seed companies. I buy from heirloom seed companies all the time. I enjoy them. Uh, those companies are doing well and should do well. But to my mind, that heirloom term really is referring to, you know, the seeds your grandma gave you or a grandpa or an uncle. Um... And so to my mind, if you're passing on your seeds, yeah, granted, that's closer to the definition of what people nowadays call land race. But if you're saving these seed populations and passing them on to friends and family, that to me is heirloom seed saving. Um, I know that's not the term as it's widely used, but that's what it means to me, sort of. <laughs> so, but I think the broader term that should be used more often anyway is open pollinated. Um and I think in that, at least in the term open pollinated, you have something that is broad, even though it may not necessarily be accurate because some plants you physically have to pollinate, um, but it, it's still more accurate to the term because it also covers new varieties that come up that are the product of traditional breeding and not creating hybrid lines and crossing them or you know any of the, any of the more complicated methods. Um, so that's my little rant on heirloom seeds. I actually have a book um, on shareable plants that I'm going to be reading here pretty quick when I finish the stuff I'm already reading. 
And I'll probably talk about that on the show too later because that's a really interesting one. Anyway, back to tomatoes. So tomatoes are in the genus Solanum, uh, same genus as potatoes and eggplants, as well as dozens of ornamental plants, including the rather popular nipple flower. <laughs> those, those little flowers that produce those little nipple-shaped fruits. Uh, also, I think sometimes called a cow's udder. Uh, it's also in the same family, or I'm sorry, the same genus as some of the flowering tobaccos, which aren't really true tobaccos. And then it's in the same family as tobacco and peppers and all those other big groups. So it's, it's a huge genus within an even huger family. Uh, one of the defining traits of the genus and of tomatoes as well is their flower structure, which is really kind of unique. They have a uh, whorl that it, it's actually pretty common for flowers to have, you know, five petals, depending upon the type of flower. The rosoids all kind of have that as well. Uh, roses, apples, that's their default flower shape is five petals and five sepals, right? Those little green petal-like structures on the back that look like little, almost between a leaf and a petal. Uh, see, they're very prominent in roses, but you also see them on the back of your tomatoes too. So you have five petals and five sepals, and then you have a superior ovary, which just means that when you look at the disc of the flower, the ovary is outside of that, right? It's not back inside like it is in, say, a rose, for instance. When you see the big rose hip, that's the ovary, an inferior ovary. It's inside the receptacle. Um, in the case of, I'm sorry, it's inside the receptacle. In the case of uh, tomatoes, it's outside. It's hard to see because the tomato flower sort of closes in around it, but if you dissect the flower, it's, it's very obvious. And then the actual anthers with the pollen, uh, those form sort of a cone around the stigma. Or I'm sorry, not the stigma, the stamen. Uh, the stigma's at the end. And so the, this structure seems kind of weird, right? It, it, why would you put all of your male parts tightly bound around the female part? But that's because in tomatoes and many of the related genera, the flower is intended to pollinate itself for the most part. Um, tomatoes can cross-pollinate, and we do cross-pollinate them to breed them. I'll get to that in a minute. But by and large, a tomato pollinates itself pretty reliably, so that's why you can save seed from them. Uh, we're going to get into, when I talk to Craig and uh, Petrina, we're going to get into how you can kind of get around that and also uh, how you use that to sort of shuffle out the traits once you've made a cross to get uh, a stable line is by letting it self-pollinate itself and sort of cross back to itself. But yeah, it, they're mostly designed to pollinate themselves. They are often pollinated by what's called buzz pollination. So when the bee or bumblebees are especially good at this, when they go near the flower and they vibrate it, it causes that pollen to fall right on the stigma. So it helps the plants pollinate more reliably, but they're pretty good at doing it on their own anyway. Um, it also means that Tomatoes are very obviously not a wind-pollinated plant. Wind pollination, it might be possible to blow pollen off of one onto the other, but reliably speaking, you're not getting any pollination from that. It's either insects or more often it's just pollinating itself. Um, and that is a big trait in tomatoes. Now, tomatoes do actually have a toxin in them, uh, solanine. It's in all of the... Uh, plants in the Solanum genus, as well as a lot of the plants in the nightshades as well. It's where a lot of the stories about them being poisonous come from. It is not really found in any significant concentration in the fruit of tomatoes. They're safe to eat. The leaves have some, but this is often overblown. Um, you can't. You could eat a tomato leaf and you would be fine. It would taste really bitter. If you ate a significant amount of it, you would get sick. The thing is, we don't know exactly what the toxic dose is. But we know it's pretty easy to hit it if you eat a lot. So don't eat any part of a tomato plant. I shouldn't have to say this, hopefully. Don't eat any part of a tomato plant that isn't the fruit. But if some, if you know a child or something eats a leaf, try to get them to spit it out. Um, but they'll probably be okay. Nobody's. It's pretty rare for people to die from consuming anything in the Solanum genus. Uh, potatoes, the actual physical potato you eat, contains little trace amounts of this toxin. And you would have to eat a couple of pounds of them to, to poison yourself. So yes, it is toxic. You could conceivably hurt yourself, but the conditions under which you would would require you to eat a lot of something that you're not really inclined to eat. So it's reasonably safe to have around children and animals. Um, just keep your eye out, basically. Um, so that's a big, broad thing. Now, some specifics, and we're going to get into this a little bit with Craig Hillier because the Dwarf Tomato Project sort of 
breaks the commonly held wisdom, but people generally think of tomatoes as either determinate or indeterminate, and there's some variation within that. Um, the determinate mutation cropped up, and it basically causes the flowers to happen at the end of stems, which limits the tomato's growth. It will grow into a big bush, it will produce a bunch of flowers, it will produce a bunch of fruit, and then it will die. Um, once it begins its reproductive growth, it's more or less slowing down to stopping its vegetative growth. So that means you get a bush that's nice and manageable, you get all your fruit at once, which is terrible if you want beefsteak tomatoes all summer long, but it's great if you want a bunch of paste tomatoes to make sauce with, because you get them all in one go, you do your canning and everything, your prep, you cook them, get it all together, and then you can them up and you store them. So that's why uh, the determinant tomatoes have actually become a very dominant tomato in the canning industry. Also, uh, to a lesser degree, uh, table tomatoes, but that's just because you can plant it and know roughly when you're going to get a harvest. It's not this continual harvest you have to keep up with. It's just all in one go. So they become very popular in a lot of commercial applications. Um, some people like them at home too because you get one big growth of them and then you're done, but also uh, because they don't have the size to grow and manage a lot of sprawling tomato vines from an indeterminate. Uh, so there's that. Now, to hybrid or not to hybrid. Um, I enjoy growing the heirloom open pollinated varieties for the most part. I have grown some hybrids. Uh, there are some super sweet cherry hybrids that are some of the best tomatoes you'll taste. Um, not the best, but they're really, really good. And I will grow those every year. So I don't really have a huge problem with those. Um, I don't think hybrids are necessarily wrong. They do limit your ability because you can't save seed, but you can grow tomatoes from cutting. And I have kept myself in sweet millions year after year after year by taking a cutting, overwintering it in a greenhouse, uh, growing it on, and then putting it out in the garden when it's reached maturity, when the weather's warmed up enough for it to go. And then I take another cutting at the end of the year and put that in the greenhouse and do it all over again. Um, we've done this a couple of years already at the garden where I work, and we've had pretty reliable sweet millions both those years so it, it it definitely works you're getting the exact same genetics now why can't i save seed because i wouldn't get the same genetics um that initial cross is from two strains whose genes have been very finely fixed so that when you cross them you get a reliable cross every time you take one plant that is not a sweet millions and you take another plant that is also not a sweet millions and you can reliably cross these two carefully bred inbred lines and every time you cross them, the seed they produce is going to be sweet millions. But that sweet millions now has a mix of those two plants' DNA. And even though it produced the sweet millions, there are a lot of recessive traits and everything floating around there. So that when it crosses with itself, i.e. if I save seed from that sweet millions, uh, it's going to shuffle the DNA. And some of the traits that I want in the sweet millions are not going to make the cut. And some of the traits that are recessive that didn't show up in the sweet millions that weren't expressed essentially might make the cut and might be expressed. So I will get a different tomato. I will not get one that looks like the sweet millions I grew. Craig Hillier goes into this in a lot of detail with how you can sort of uh, shuffle out the lines from there. But the gist is you're not going to get what you expect when you use hybrid seed. And so you can take cuttings like I do, or you can just buy it every year, but you can't grow them reliably from their own seed. Um, so that's about all I really have to say. I think that's a pretty good primer for the basics. Craig goes into a lot more in the interview, which we'll get into in just a second here. Well, this week's guests are the two heads of the Dwarf Tomato Project, uh, Craig LaHoulier, who directed the American team and is also the author of Epic Tomatoes and the book I reviewed last week on Strawbell Gardening with Vegetables. And the other is uh, Petrina Nuske Smalls. She does the Epic, or sorry, not the Epic, the Dwarf Tomato Project over in Australia. Um, so that's her half of it, and she runs the Australian team. Uh, Petrina, why don't you go ahead and get started and just tell people a little bit of your background with gardening? Okay, uh, my gardening history is, is more or less pretty brief. I didn't really start gardening until um, uh, about. 15 years ago, I suppose, and that was after I'd finished my degree at university. Um, and I was doing a lot of other sort of research as well on, on other topics that were of interest to me. And I felt like I'd been 
having my head in the books for years and years and had been inside, stuck in doors for years and years. And I thought, I just got to get outside. <laughs> I need to really get outside. And, and I, I started to get a bit interested in growing stuff to eat. Um, I've always been interested in health. And so I thought, oh, I'd, I think I need to learn how to grow my own food a little bit. And I started, you know, with a few different things in my backyard in suburban Adelaide. And uh, it wasn't very long before I started to search from the internet for more information about things. And I came across the Tomato Forum, and that's where I came across Craig. Um, and from there, the, it just sort of all blossomed out. So you went from almost no gardening experience to helping manage a large breeding project. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Good way to get started. Uh, you know, the, the funny thing is about, I would say, 80% of the things I know about Australia, I know because of Gardening Australia. Cause we, oh, really? In, in, I'm sure Craig is familiar with this, but here in the U.S., uh, gardening on mainstream TV has kind of died. You can, you can catch, we have a couple of shows on PBS, but that's about it. Um, and so the the gardening show i watch every you know week or so is gardening australia because <laughs> so, oh. it's only what and of course your your climate is the opposite of ours so every you know all your winter episodes happen in summer here and vice versa um, yes but yes. yeah it, it's it's helped out a lot and, and you know as a side effect i picked up a lot of weird australian stuff <laughs> just by watching it you know knowing kind of the <laughs> geography a little better uh-huh yeah so okay so and i mean I, I don't know that we have to, since I'm pretty sure that most gardeners in America know who Craig is. <laughs> uh, but can I'm, you not, over... I'm not even sure who I am, Troy. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm just saying, if you if you turn to any gardening YouTube channel or anything, you eventually show up on them. So. <laughs> oh, that's so weird. Um, yeah, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> it's been, you know, it's it, one of the weirdest things about my post book life is. Um, that there there is some publicity and i'm even though i'm I'm kind of extroverted publicity is not my favorite thing so any what i any opportunity i have to share what i'm learning and learn from other people i'm really happy to participate in and that i think patrina and i have both been using that kind of as, as our guard, guiding light through gardening it's just uh share and learn and you can't go wrong if you do that and i actually yeah. have your book out in front of me uh but we're not going to talk about that too much today because we're going to focus more on the dwarf tomato project so I just have it out in case I have a question that pops into my head and I want to reference something real quick to ask you. Sure. You do have a couple of pictures of the dwarf tomatoes. Now, had the project, I know you guys have wrapped up the project, like the formal part of it, essentially. Um, obviously, people will still be using these plants for years, but uh, how soon after the book was written, did you, had you finished it or was the book written closer to the beginning of the project? Wow. So the project really was conceived through discussions that Petrina and I were having in GardenWeb in 2005. And I wasn't even approached by Story Publishing to write the book until about 2012. Our first releases from the project happened at around 2010. So in a way, the book came along at a time where the project was really chugging along at maximum steam. And uh, it has been the hardest thing to completely shut because we keep happening upon interesting things to explore. Uh, you know, and if we didn't end up with this issue that Petrina and I had to face some years ago where it became impossible to trade seeds back and forth between the US and Australia, I think it would be chugging along at probably five times the rate that it is now. But, you know, we've had to separate our efforts. Uh, it's, it, we still have 106 releases in the U.S., and Petrina's doing a great job of getting them out there in Australia. But, uh, you know, I could be sad over what the splitting of our efforts have left undone. But I think we cranked it up enough so that things are continuing to happen, even, w even without absolutely close supervision at this point. And actually, that was something I wanted to ask you about, so we can just do it now. Um, as far as you guys actually ran into problems with import controls into Australia, shipping so many seeds back and forth, right? That's that's what you're talking about when you say your project ended up having to be split. Yes, yes, indeed. That's that's exactly the, the issue that came up. And it was really very disappointing at the time because it was very obvious that if, 
if we were, or if, yeah, if it was an, a large corporation that was involved, it wouldn't have been a problem because you could just give a sample of seeds to the um, import people and they would test the seeds for various viroids and then say, yes, you're all clean, go ahead, import. But we, we were just uh, transferring, you know, a bare handful of seeds on each variety. So it was just impossible um, to pay. I, I could have actually paid per per variety for them to grow out, say, a half a dozen plants and then test them after eight weeks. But it, I figured out that to pay for the um, greenhouse expenses and their staff for looking after the plants and then doing the tests, it would cost $1,000 per variety. So it was impossible, just impossible. Well, especially for an amateur project. Uh, an amateur project where the pay isn't particularly good being pretty much <laughs> zero. <laughs> Well, that's true because that's another aspect of it is you guys have actually basically given these varieties away in a sense because you release them under the uh, OSSI pledge, right? Yep. Yeah. I mean, even before we discovered OSSI, one of the uh, – so there were some principles that we laid down for the project early on. And it was that anybody can play, so you didn't have to be a professional gardener. In fact, what we were looking for were the people who just were loaded with curiosity and – they may have been good or great at growing tomatoes. They may have been good or great or terrible at documentation or photography, but they were hands. They were people who could plant seed and then share with us the results. So, that, so it was all amateur, all volunteer. And then at the end of the day, if we found something great, the idea was to reward some of these wonderful small seed companies that were willing to take a chance on our, our work and release them. And uh, I've, it looks like I'm going to be going to the Organic Seed Alliance meeting in Corvallis, Oregon in um, February of next year. And this will be the first time that I'm actually attending something as a, quote, breeder, unquote. And I, and I think one of the discussion points that, that will get talked about is should there be some level of compensation or if, if people are doing work to create varieties that are going to benefit the greater good of the gardening public, should there be some mechanism in place to to help that along? Because I know that you could put five or six breeders in a room and some of them won't release anything unless they get paid. Others like us are kind of, I guess, we're the altruistic breeders club and we just love to to give stuff away. But, you know, other people's lives are depending on this. So it's a, it's a controversial subject. And until now, not a lot of amateur breeders are out there doing the sort of things we're doing. But now it's becoming much more common. So it's a it's an issue that's going to have to get dealt with at some point, I think. And I mean, that's that's really one of the reasons why hybrids have become as popular as they are, because there isn't a lot of money in uh, breeding a variety once you've finished, because then the seed kind of becomes a commodity. But with hybrids, you control that seed you know, it doesn't exist without you. You never release the original strains that produce the hybrid. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in a, in a sense, that's a way of making money out of breeding when that doesn't normally exist. Yeah. Um, Petrina, what's your views on that? Because I, th I don't think we ever had any doubt that we wanted to do it this way because I think it, having to make money off it and decide who in the project got paid what would to me have stripped a lot of the fun and freedom out of it. I agree. Yeah, wholeheartedly I agree. And it just seemed like a, a level that I wasn't really interested in anyway because I was so interested in having help to uh, explore these various um, crosses that we made. Um, yeah, that was the important part. And also the the collaboration and the it just was such a wonderful uh, atmosphere that we had mm when we explored all of these things and the excitement that we got and yeah. people who perhaps never had any in, you know, experience in growing very much and they got something unusual and, you know, they were so delighted and they could name it themselves and it just <laughs> seemed so, so important, all of those aspects. And to try to make money from it just was the last thing I could possibly <laughs> imagine. Um, it would, would have been just ludicrous. Uh, but what's interesting about that, Petrina, is it also exhibits some of the magic of you and I meeting and doing this together. So if, if anyone ever would believe that there are fates in the world that direct people to meet <laughs> and, and things to be taken up, it, this is one of those magical moments where 
from you and I meeting to being on the common platform to having the same philosophy to um, even having complementary skills in terms of crossing and you know management of data. Um, it, it's been one of the absolute highlights of, so you said that you've been gardening for about 15 years and I've been gardening for almost 40. And this project has actually been one of the absolute highlights of my 40 years of gardening, as well as the friendship that you and I have cultivated. Ha, no pun intended there. But um, <laughs> <laughs> cool. uh, well, I should take this gardening stuff a lot uh, less seriously, but, you know. <laughs> and I, I have noticed that the Australian team tended to, like, when you look at the varieties that came from the American side, it's a mix of different names. A lot of names are, you know, sort of an homage to whatever variety they were trying to kind of imitate. But on the Australian side, you guys went with a lot more specifically Australian names where you could. Yes, that was me entirely because I I really understood really from the beginning that because Australia is such a small country population wise and we have such a small gardening sort of sector amongst that and, and compared to America, your population is huge and your gardening um, people who are interested is also absolutely huge and I realised that it wouldn't be very long before that, that the Australian side of it would easily be forgotten if I didn't actually name some of the varieties that connected those particular varieties to Australia and so that was my idea to do that. Um, I'm already in my 70s and so one of these days and in fact I'm the only person on the Australian continent that sells the varieties uh, for seeds for, for anybody. Um, I worry a little bit that once I'm no longer around, that just seeds won't be even available in Australia. So the fact that they've got Australian names, some of them, it just keeps that link to Australia. And, and you know, one of the other interesting um, outcomes of the uniqueness of the names is it allows us those of us who can, who can go out to speak to this project, and I love it when in my tomato talks I get to talk about this project, I show a picture of Ferticae, which if you look at the spelling of it, looks like Werico Hay. So uh, Richard Watson, who lives in New Zealand, found this beautiful red and gold colored tomato, and he decided I need to give it a Maori, a local language name, for red and gold, and hence Ferticae. So it becomes a point of, you know, what is this funny looking impossible to pronounce tomato that's absolutely delicious and absolutely beautiful, and it allows you to speak to how some of these are named. And I think, Petrina, these will, the, these will never be forgotten. I think solving the issue of getting them sold by a commercial company in Australia, that, that's a bit of a disappointment that, that that continues to be a struggle, and it's a bit, I think it's a bit reflective of where we are, how fragmented things are in gardening, not invented here syndrome, the prominence of hybrids and, and, you know, so many, so many other topics that we could branch into and would bore maybe most of your audience, but they're really, <laughs> but they're really important topics to touch upon. And some of Petrina's Australian name varieties, such as Rosella Crimson and Rosella Purple, they'll never be forgotten because they're amongst our very best flavored dwarfs out there and people just love them. I mean, you know, I would say Rosella Purple may be, of all the 106, one of the top five in terms of what people think of it. Yes, I agree. Yeah, indeed. Out of the Australian varieties, the most famous is the one you developed, the Uluru. Uh. Yes, yes, Uluru Oka. And a lot of people don't know how to pronounce Uluru. Um, I've noticed in YouTube videos, there's um, someone from Renaissance Farms, I think he didn't know how to pronounce it, or a couple of other people I noticed um, were struggling to, to pronounce it, but it's pronounced Uluru. Was I close? I forget how you said it. Yeah, you were. You were very <laughs> close. You know, I, it's kind of like my name. If you pronounce everything you see, you get there. And it's like, I think some people, <laughs> some people try to get fancy with it. Um, the great thing about Uluru ochre is that we discovered a color, and it's shown up again in a few other varieties, such as tiger eye. The, uh, but Uluru ochre is the very first black orange, whereas, you know, if, if Rosella purple is a black pink and Cherokee chocolate is a black red, well, Uluru is a black orange. And uh, I remember the excitement, Petrina, when you, when you found that. <laughs> it, it was. I thought it was a rotten tomato. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen the pictures, and it does look like a tomato on the way out, with the pale orange color and darker shoulders. 
Well, the, the very the very first sample was from my brother who had grown uh, a, a non-dwarf. It wasn't actually a dwarf plant from the first generation after the hybrid generation. But I was curious to see what some of the non-dwarfs would, would produce. And I was collecting samples. And when I got to this particular plant, I thought the, this this fruit looks rotten. And um, <laughs> I thought, well, I'll, I'll feel it. And it felt soft and a bit mushy. And I thought, I'll still take it for seeds. You know, I can still grow the seeds and see what I get. Anyway, when I cut it open, the smell was great. and it looked all right. It didn't look rotten. And so I thought I'd taste a little bit and it blew me away. It just absolutely <laughs> blew me away. And I thought, this isn't rotten. This is just the colour it gets when it's really ripe. And so after that, in, you know, in future generations, you, you can see it was not quite so, you know, deep in colour and so on, but still had that strange colouring. Yeah, it's it's one of my favourites for sure. But, you know, Troy, you raise an interesting question because we've been selling seedlings in Raleigh for maybe 20, 25 years. So we were kind of at the forefront of heirlooms where, you know, most people went to the market looking for red tomatoes, maybe a pink tomato. And one of the frequent questions I guess it, I get asked, and Katrina, I've never really wondered if this has troubled people growing the dwarfs. When do I pick that particular tomato? So if no one has ever grown an Uluru oak or even a Rosella purple or a, a big green dwarf, they get really nervous about knowing when to pick some of these varieties that are just not your standard reds and pinks. And I always tell them the same thing, squeeze a little bit, you know, give it the Charmin test. And if it's uh, if it yields, pluck it. And, uh, you know, plants produce more than one. So go slice it and, and just test it. But we this project has actually pro has educated a lot of the public as to the possibilities of the range of tomato colors and they can grow them on their patio. So, you know, it's been such a great asset to uh, people really seem to love the varieties. Yes, there's so many pluses really, aren't there, Craig? Yeah, yeah. We, I think we just hit the nail on the head when we yep. started this project. It was just amazing and it continues. I think going forward into the future, it's going to become even more and more, um, you know, the thing that people need because they've got a lot of, well, a lot of people who don't live in, rural areas and they they don't really have space often in in urban cities and so on yeah and yeah. you know they still want to grow something to eat themselves that hasn't been sprayed or killed or genetically yeah. modified or you know <laughs> all of those things and still yeah. has flavor you know absolutely yeah. wonderful flavor i do have a technical question is a dwarf what is sometimes called a semi-determinate tomato um no, it was actually the, the the synonym for dwarf tomato in the old sea catalogs was actually tree or station. And, uh, it, and this is what was interesting about Katrina and I jumping into this project when we did, because the first dwarf was actually known in an American seed catalog in the mid-1850s, mid and it was called Tomato Delay, D-E capital L-A-E. It was discovered as a mutation in an indeterminate variety in a, in a chateau in France. The fruit was small, it was red, and it was it, it was not distinguishable. It was pretty much unique. Um, they described the thick central stem. They described the, the crinkly, dark bluish green foliage. And then a few others popped out, dwarf champion, golden dwarf champion. But they've always been the third major type of tomato growth habit that was lurking in the backgrounds because there were so few in existence and no one had the range of the colorful heirlooms that we did from the mid 70s once the seed savers exchange got going and then seed catalogs started popping up with hundreds of varieties of tomatoes it was almost as if that growth habit was sitting there ready for Katrina and I to play along with because it really has never, it was never extrapolated out to push the boundaries of what was possible. And so we got to cross the five or six known dwarfs with Cherokee purple and chocolate and green and brandy wine and you name it. And, he, and that's how we, you know, we were just lucky to be in the right place in the right time with the right idea on the same website, I think. Yes, I agree. Totally. Yep. There is another type of dwarf, isn't there? The dwarf determinants, which grow to about a foot tall, put all, all their fruit, and then die as they ripen? Uh, the micro dwarfs, yes. Yeah, uh, and Red Robin was really the best known of those. There's actually there is actually a whole group at, a, at the Tomatoville website that are playing with those now, and they're taking 
the very few known microdwarfs like red robin and crossing all kind of tomatoes onto those to see if they can come up with these little 12 to 15 inch plants, but they have larger and better flavored and interestingly colored fruit. So they're, they're kind of coming along behind us and doing their own project. Um, on, Petrina, I don't think you've played in their sandbox yet, and I've just dabbled in it because frankly, we haven't had time to extend into that area. And I'm happy to let them do their thing, really. Yes, and I haven't actually started to even look at, the, at any of those um, uh, posts because I've, I'm just really <laughs> caught up in our project still and yep. concentrating. So the dwarf and micro dwarf are completely different growth habits from determinant, semi-determinant, and the sprawling indeterminates. Yeah, try, try how, what's a good way to think about them, Troy, and to have maybe your listeners think about them. Think of an indeterminate tomato, like you said, they, they, they sprawl. I measured, uh, I measured my tomato plant growth over the last few years. And indeterminate tomatoes, when they're in the, the peak of their, their vigor, grow two to three inches a day, a day. So, you know, extrapolate that out to seven days and to 14 days. How I think of dwarf tomatoes now is they behave like indeterminates and that they will fruit till frost and they put out gradual clusters of fruit, but they only grow vertically at one inch per day. So if at the end of your season, your Cherokee purple is eight or 10 feet tall, your dwarf variety, given the amount of sun it gets, is going to be four feet tall, maybe a little bit more if it gets less sun, maybe a little bit less. But if people keep that in mind, it's, it's kind of the indeterminate advantages, but you don't have to climb a ladder to stake it. You don't have to prune suckers off. You just put a nice little cage on it, tie it to a short post and let it go. And it will uh, give you tomatoes gradually until the end of the season. So the difference is largely in the internode lengths, not in the number of leaves or the fruit set. Right. The, if the clusters are closer to each other. So in an indeterminate, they're going to be eight to 10 inches away from each other. And the dwarfs, um, they're much closer. And, and some of them, you know, each of the 106 varieties have different habits, like, like Rosella purple, like got these sprays with 12 or 15 blossoms on it, and they're not all going to set fruit. And then it will take a little while till that next big spray comes out. Um, here's the most interesting point in this discussion is these 106 have not been comparatively grown out on a scale where somebody's growing 20 of each of them and they're looking at comparative maturity dates, comparative heights, comparative disease resistance and tolerance in different areas of the country. So in a way, Petrina and I, our project gave birth to them and really now it's up to the gardening public to put them through their paces and help us to learn more about which ones are gonna do well in which locations of the country. Uh, which ones do people seem to love to eat? Which one of them do we put out? Because they're interesting, but maybe they just don't have quite the flavor that we had hoped for in different areas of the country. Um, so in a way, this, this project is still in its infancy in terms of what, we're, what we need to learn about them now that we've, we've launched them out there. Now, since these are recent hybrids, how stable are they genetically? Do they come true reliably? Uh, Petrina? Um, we've taken them really up to, you know, seven, eight, ten, some mm. of them, or, before, or even more generations. And they're, they're completely stable once they get to that sort of point. Um, there is one exception that I've had a real headache with, and that's <laughs> kangaroo paw red. For some reason, every now and again, it'll throw back a yellow or a green or a brown. Um, and Craig, even from seeds that I got from you back when I could still get seeds, and I think uh -huh. it was already about the eighth or ninth yeah. generation, and yeah. one was one was red and one was yellow, you know, yep. that I grew. It's crazy, but yeah. that's the only one I can think of that's the exception. Yeah. Yeah, we, I think there's kind of a generality in a project that when we do a very wide cross with lots of color possibilities, it's often that the red tomato, that's the supermarket color tomato, the color of celebrity and big boy, because that's the dominant trait, if we're using lots of recessive traits, it is often very hard to completely get it to come up red every time if we're aiming for red. Um, there's one that I love called Sweet Scarlet Dwarf, and it's out of the tipsy line. And every now and then somebody will grow a sweet scarlet dwarf and they'll get a yellow, which actually we've released and named as dwarf golden gypsy. And then there's another line called beauty, which has stripes and it's a very wide cross and we've got all kinds of colors. And just the other day, somebody on the internet um, mentioned that they were growing 
dwarf firebird suite, which is supposed to be a pink with stripes, and they ended up with a yellow with a bicolor interior and with stripes. And it's just what I had to say is, you know, we take it out to the seventh or eighth generation, but some of these families, there is so much going on with the genetics that it's just a little bit harder to say these one are 100% stable. So maybe some of these have been released at 95 to 98% stable. But the only way we know that is if a customer will come back to Victory or one of the other companies and say, well, you know, I planted a red, I got a pink, but hey, it's delicious anyway. What do you think's going on? And that gives us a chance to go in, take a look and decide whether it's just one of a little bit of lingering instability showing itself at that point. Interesting. Uh, Petrina, in one of your interviews, you were suggesting that breeders should make sure the dwarf is female, and then you could be sure if it was successful if the offspring come up indeterminate. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, that's correct. If if you're actually um, adding pollen to a flower that you've emasculated on a dwarf plant, and you're adding um, pollen from a large indeterminate plant, um, you will set seeds in that fruit, and when you grow the seeds from that, you are growing the hybrid generation, the first generation. And because dwarfism is a recessive trait, even though you picked the tomato off of a dwarf and save seeds off of a dwarf, that first generation will not be dwarf. And so that proves that you were successful with making the cross. Because otherwise they would all come out dwarf. Yes, yes, if you happen to get if you happen to grow the seeds and, and, and one of them was dwarf, well, that's just one little piece of um, self-pollination that occurred before you did the cross. It Does saves a lot, uh, it, and it saves a lot of time because I, I did five crosses this year and I'm not sure if they took, but in a week or so, I'm gonna plant just a few seeds of each. And if they pop up indeterminate, I'll know that I have myself a successful cross and the next year I can equally anticipate seeing what it's going to do. If they pop out dwarf, then I'll know I won't waste my time planting those seeds. Um, and it, when you, I think that's an imp important thing for amateur breeders to understand is make it easy on yourself by using uh, basic genetics knowledge so that you can learn things as quickly as possible. Otherwise, you're spinning your wheels. People that are doing indeterminate times indeterminate crosses, if they're not including a potato leaf in the mix, that leads to a lot of work that needs to be done to not only see if your cross was done, but then depending on the colors you use, you could be growing out generation after generation and really all you're doing is growing out the same variety. The cross didn't took, but you didn't make it easy for, you, for yourself to find out if that was the case or not. That makes sense. Okay, so you make the initial cross, you grow out the seed normally, then you collect the self-pollinated seed from that generation, grow those out, then you're looking for plants in that third generation to work with, hoping that the right genes are shuffled out in those self-pollinated generations, right? Yeah, Petrina, you want to talk just about the kind of basic Mendelian genetics that show up in the in the second generation? Um, in the second generation, it's just really an exploration to just see what turns up. You, you, you really have no idea what's going to turn up. Um, you can choose, uh, in the case of crossing a dwarf with uh, a normal in, indeterminate regular type of tomato, um, you, you can decide whether or not you want to grow um, dwarfs only or if you want to grow a mixture of them because you can still find dwarfs in the third generation. Uh, and that's, in fact, what happened with Uluru Oka. Um, I found the first dwarf of that particular colour to tomato in the third generation. Um, but yes, you can just explore, or if you've already got set in your mind what you uh, are trying to find, you just have to hope that it'll turn up <laughs> and grow as many plants as you can. Yeah. In the second generation, really, if you if you draw the Punnett square out, it, it just follows really good uh, math that Gregor Mendel would, would have uh, found when he played with the pea seed. So you save seeds from that hybrid that you grew. Uh, it, it, you know, there's one interesting point. You could take a delicious dwarf and a delicious hybrid and you won't, uh, a delicious indeter um, heirloom indeterminate. It may not be a delicious hybrid, but you can't let that derail you because the, the flavor will pop out later, most more often than not. But when you grow that hybrid out, uh, you'll get a three to one mix. 75% will be indeterminate uh, and then 25% will be dwarf. And what most people in our project do 
is they've been tossing the indeterminates because we are focused on creating new dwarf varieties and they take that 25%. Now, if you're using potato leaf in there, 25% of the 25% will be potato leaf. Uh, so it, it, you can use kind of just basic genetics math to understand what you're gonna see. Once you have a dwarf, you then have fixed that trait 100%. So you save seeds from that dwarf plant and you, you, you don't have to deal with the three to one anymore. You know that every seedling is gonna be dwarf. Now you're into looking at fruit sizes, fruit shapes, colors and flavors. And that's where growing the largest population of dwarfs that you, you find out that you can, you'll get a handle on what the diversity is like that you're looking at. And uh, then hopefully you can find your target. target. You've mentioned the different families a couple of times. You've actually named your families based on the seven dwarves, haven't you? <laughs> yes, we did. Are there cladistics at play here? Uh, are the traits inherent in a sneezy or a bashful? <laughs> well, um, there's one that I called plentiful. Uh, that was a, a cross between um, a dwarf called Wilpina and uh, Cherokee purple. And in fact, all of the progeny, the varieties, it's one of my favourite crosses because it's got a lot of my favourite varieties in it. And they are all plentiful. It's amazing that that just happened accidentally. Yeah. <laughs> But I, but I think in terms of um, early on, you know, Dopey, Sneezy, Doc, I, I think Petrina ran out of names way too fast because we have 100 families, but <laughs> Disney only created seven dwarfs. And that's how we've ended up with things like Sleazy and, uh, you know, we've had to come up with some less savory names just to keep a little bit of a sense of humor in the project. And uh, it gets harder and harder to name families the more crosses you make. So I think I better stop, Petrina. <laughs> <laughs> You've, you've been very inventive with your names. I, I oh, really gosh. <laughs> I've been out of control. I'm out of control, Troy, I confess. <laughs> and now I have to ask, where are the traits common to the Sleazy family? Oh, man. Um, well, it's a, here, Craig, yeah. that's your, your question. I can't answer that one. Well, so Bruce Bradshaw, one of our very first volunteers, created Sleazy as his donation to the project early on. So while Petrina was making her first seven, he was making his, and it turned out to be, this isn't a pun, but it was a dirty cross, meaning he, um, <laughs> yeah, I know it's a bad pun, but it works. So he, he did a cross and he didn't think it took, so he reapplied with a different variety. So s sleazy is either, um, I'm trying to think, oh God, carbon times, Go, uh, dwarf champion or carbon times new big dwarf and how you know which hybrid you have is if you grow it out and you end up with a hybrid that's one to one and a half pounds large you know that the the breeding partner of that one was new big dwarf because that's two big tomatoes together and if you grow it out what became sleazy b you end up with a hybrid that's maybe six ounces or so and uh Really, the purpose of that cross was to get purples into dwarfs, and so I think the only named variety out of the Sleazy Cross was actually one that I named after my father, Dwarf Wild Fred. His name was Wilfred, but it's an absolutely delicious one-pound purple oblate, very productive dwarf that is essentially a Cherokee purple look-alike, and Cherokee purple is my father's favorite tomato. So um, thanks to Bruce Bradshaw, and, we, and we've lost touch with him for years now. We, we have people dip into the project, and they, they play with it for a lot, and then they disappear, and we don't know where they go, or we don't hear from them again. And uh, Bruce is a very talented gardener, a nice guy, and he just maybe moved on to a different hobby or a different group to associate with. But um, thanks to Bruce for Sleazy, and thanks to Sleazy for a new big dwarf. I mean, for um, Dwarf Wild Fred, a wonderful... I, I think of it as an analog almost, or a synonymous looking and tasting to Rizella purple, but they're both out there. Because they're from utterly different families, completely different families. So family in this case are all the descendants of a single cross? Yeah, so so the Sleazy family has Dwarf Wild, Wild Fred, and the Sleepy family has Rosella Crimson and Rosella Purple. So we'll do a cross. And they will lead to named offsprings. And we call those offsprings as having originated at the family that was identified when the first cross was made and named uh, early on by Petrina. 
Yes, so the family is always the hybrid generation only. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, you know, if we were to look at when Petrina decided to uh, cross Golden Dwarf Champion, which was a one of the known dwarfs from the late 1800s, nice little yellow tomato, and she crossed it with this somewhat obscure indeterminate called Green Giant, which was a green fruit of potato leaf. I would say just about 90% of everything that popped out of that cross, which she called Sneezy, has been knock your socks off delicious. And we may have almost 10 named varieties just out of that one cross. So that was your, I think Plentiful and Sneezy, Petrina, may have been your two Bonanza crosses. Yes, I think so. Uh, they're just really delicious. They're, uh, yeah, you're right. Just about everything coming from those crosses is wonderful. Are the seed companies including the names in their descriptions? Petrina, what do you think? Uh, look, I think you probably know better than me because most of those are Northern Hemisphere companies that I might not necessarily be familiar with. Sure. Uh, so our intent and our suggestion early on was a request that if we give you these seeds, will you please use this description? And that description that we generate lays everything out. It lays out the family. It lays a little of the history. And it also provides the names of the most significant people that were involved in stable, identifying, naming, stabilizing the variety. Now, that was only a request early on. And that was very easy to control when we had essentially four seed companies, Heritage, Tatiana's Tomato Base, Victory, and Sample Seed Shop were really doing our first early set. Once it gets beyond that, um, so for example, Tomato Fest now, Gary Ibsen's company is starting to list them. Um, Fruition Seeds in New York is starting to list them. Really, the cat's out of the bag at that point, and it's it, it, and the dwarfs are at the are the victims of any other heirloom or open pollinated variety out there where different sites are going to list different levels of information. And, uh, you know, it, it is going to be tough to prevent the occasional bit of misinformation to start appearing along some of these, because that's just, that's just what's happened ever since, you know, open pollinated seed companies started to come out and sell you know, and then you started seeing all kinds of warped histories of Cherokee purple or Brandywine or any other variety. So, you know, that that's that's just the perils of being an open pollinated vegetable variety these days is you're at the mercy of the catalogs to be really stringent and accurate about what they say about the variety. And there's another level of complexity to add to that, and that's because, because the project actually have um, asked that... Um, the designation of open source seed initiative be applied to all of the varieties, no matter mm -hmm. where they're sold. And I think that that's unlikely to be found on every person's website either. But it is quite an important um, thing because um, in, in terms of what we are hoping to achieve uh, by designating them open source seed initiative is that we want them to be declared as freely available to anybody for whatever purpose they might need them for. Um, and they are never to be um, restricted from anybody for any reason, and certainly not for any corporate interest in, in doing the sorts of things that they like to do to seeds. And, and, and ownership, you know, they wanted to, to claim ownership, whereas we believe that these seeds should be the own ownership for any person who wants to grow them. Um, so that's another sort of level. Yes. and. Um, the Open Source Seed Initiative have declared also, we had a bit of trouble trying to work out how we were going to um, how we were going to get them listed, even at the Open Source Seed Initiative, in terms of um, who, who is going to be acknowledged as the breeder. And so in the end, with the help of Carol Depp, we worked out that the best way to do it was to actually call the project itself the breeder of these tomatoes mm -hmm. because of all the collaborative work that um, all the people and volunteers have done. And so, yes, the breeder for the Dwarf Tomato Project varieties is the Dwarf Tomato Project. Yeah, I mean, we've had 600 plus people dip their fingers and toes and gardens into this project between 2005 and 2019. That's that's a lot of people. That's a lot of energy. That's a lot of enthusiasm. It's a lot of creativity. And uh, 
you know, one of the next things I want to do, Troy, is to finish, because it's begun, um, the book on this project, and that will be my third book, will be telling the story of everything about this project, how it came about, how we did it, um, trying to keep it out of the weeds and genetics so that it will become a book that everybody would like to read that's a gardener, and that's going to be that's going to be tricky. I'm going to have to uh, think about a way to do that. So it will have some genetics 101, but definitely nothing um, honors level so that we have to, so that we don't scare people off um, in terms of what we're trying to describe. And I'll be I'll be communicating with Katrina as I get into certain chapters and ha having her take a look, um, because I want Katrina to agree with every word of what will be in the book, because it will be just as reflective of what of her skills and dedication and what she's done is mine. It will be kind of our book um, out Ooh. there. So. That was actually a question I had, namely, if this is going to be a book for one or both of you. Yeah, definitely. It has to because no one, you know, we know other breeding projects have popped up. We know that at least one breeding project has tried to, let's say, borrow, quote unquote, but I could be a little nastier than that, our varieties without attributing them to us. So before any other kind of mischief goes on out there, we need to get the story told and accurate so that, um, you know, nobody is kind of stealing our story and, and kind of putting it off as their own work. Um, it means a lot to us what we did. So, uh, you know, my wife felt the same way before Epic Tomatoes came out. She hounded me for 20 years to write that book, and I did. Once you get something down in paper and, and archived and accurate, then at least you've got your stake in the ground. So I'm hoping early to mid next year, I'm going to self-publish it, and uh, we'll just see how that goes. I've got a name for it, but I'm not sure I want to say it right yet, just in case. <laughs> so, Craig, do you feel like you've doomed yourself to writing tomato books for the rest of your life? No. I Well, you know, I wrote about straw bale gardening. I want to do a um, kind of a, a driveway garden cookbook that my wife and I will do together. And But I'm really interested in, in history. So I would love to do a book on gardening history in, in the country using different seed catalog scans. And, you know, and I'm not developing dwarf tomatoes. I love to sleuth old varieties. I've been in the Seed Savers Exchange since 86. I think I've got four or 5,000 different types of tomatoes and uh, the letters of everyone who's ever sent me seeds. So I'm sitting on kind of a a lot of information that I really need to do something with and get out there while I still can. So um, now writing will probably be something I'll continue to do because I enjoy it. And just to wrap up, Petrina, do you have any new projects on uh, for us to look out for? Um, well, since since we were no longer able to share seeds between uh, the US and Australia, um, I've been working on um, three crosses that I actually did before I moved to the place where I'm currently living, and um, I'm calling I'm calling that my Gondwana series, and so that's what I've been working on, and I've got four to the release stage, and I need to actually pledge them on the Open Source Seed Initiative first before I do anything else. And so that's my next job. Yay! Due to the issues with import restrictions, are the Australian developed are the Australian developed varieties available in the U.S.? Um, uh, Craig's probably more up to date with that than I am, actually. Um, well, do you know? I just have this general sense that it's much easier to get seeds from Australia to the U.S. because we don't seem to have the concern about some of the virioids that are that. It, that in it, but it's become almost impossible um, in to to ship seeds the other way into Australia. I, that's my sense, Petrina. Do you have yes, any sense like that my, as well? That's my sense. Yes, that's my sense as well. Yes, I think it's probably I, I would be able to send seeds over there much more easily than people can send them here. Yeah. So then we can buy Uluru ochre in the U.S. Um, oh, Uluru ochre right. definitely available. Yeah, we were still collaborating when that one's out there. It's um. The best way to figure out what all of them are um, that are available widely is to look at the Victory Seed Site because they've got anything that's released. I think there's 106 of them they have listed on their site. Um, they don't have any of Katrina's new creations yet. And I'm also finishing up a couple that we uh, have worked on in the project, uh, like Brinda Bella. I think I'll be finished with that. Ah, this week. yeah, great. And so I'll send that up to you guys over there. And um, there's another one. I just can't think what it is at the minute. 
Um, but anyway, yeah, you, the American team will definitely have access to all that I release. That's great to hear. Well, it's a little great to hear. Now I have to buy many, many more seeds. <laughs> <laughs> My day job is at a learning garden with children, and this year we grew a couple dozen indeterminate varieties, which worked out very well, other than needing some wrangling. Uh, I'm thinking of doing next year's patch in dwarf varieties, which should be much easier to manage. Well, and Troy, if you want to work in some of our works in progress that aren't finished yet, but they're really fun, like, for example, uh, I crossed a really popular but almost impossible to get cherry tomato called Mexico Midget. Impossible because you can't get the thing to germinate. Um, so no seed company can sell the authentic strain. It, it, uh, anything out there is, not, is, is already crossed up. But I crossed that with our one pound green variety from the Sneezy line called Summertime Green. And we have this rainbow of dwarf cherry tomatoes popping out. We call it the Teensy line. But we've got them in white and pink and chocolate and green and purple and red, and they're delicious. So um, we're also playing with variegated foliage. And uh, just let me know, and I'll send you some things out, uh, and you can turn into a little bit of a test garden. And, you know, there's never any pressure. You must send this back. You must report this out. Just have fun with it. And I can send you some real diverse things that will blow the kids' socks off in terms of pushing the envelope on what tomatoes can look like. Great idea. That sounds amazing. I will definitely take you up on that. Great. Did you have anything you wanted to say before we wrap things up? I uh, miss see I miss seeing my friend Petrina. Uh, <laughs> Pet Petrina came to our Tomato Palooza tasting 2009, 2008 in that in that time frame, maybe 2009. So um, it's been 10 years, but she's a one of those dear friends that I never get to see. But I'm just so glad you're in the world, Petrina. It's a better place with you in it. <laughs> and likewise, Craig, I actually feel exactly the same way. It's just been such a wonderful collaboration. And and I've so much appreciated the fact that as a team, like you mentioned earlier, the sort of skills that we have just somehow complement each other. Because I know that I would have been in a hopeless position if I had <laughs> to control all of the data that he has managed to control. And the, and the size of the team that you've actually had just would have I would have been helpless, absolutely a helpless mess. <laughs> and so it's it's just been wonderful, really wonderful. And I, I'm actually enjoying the opportunity to talk with you on a podcast too. And um, so thank you, Troy, for asking us. You're both absolutely welcome. This has been great. Okay, I'm going to preface this part of the show <laughs> by saying that I got all the info I brought up during the uh, initial part of the show and a lot of stuff that came up with my interview with Craig LaHulier, a lot of that is also found in this book. So I'm going to try not to repeat myself too much as I'm talking about the contents of the book, but I just wanted to let you know that up front. Uh, this is really the first like major book about tomatoes that I've read, other than finding stuff in various forums and stuff on the internet. Incidentally, a really good forum for tomatoes is the I believe it's the Tomatoville forum. I'll link to it in the notes. It's the one that uh, Craig did a lot of the initial discussion about the Dwarf Tomato Project on. It's also where several other projects are ongoing. Uh, you can find a lot of really great information on tomatoes there as well. But this book was a pretty good uh, foundation for my current knowledge of tomatoes. So if I source from it a lot, that's why. Okay, so what is the book? Epic Tomatoes, How to Select and Grow the Best Varieties of All Time by Craig LaHulier. Uh, on the back, sweet success. Grow and harvest the best tomatoes ever with this practical and beautiful guide by tomato expert Craig LaHulier. Along the way, you'll learn about this fascinating fruit's history and meet 33 of LaHulier's favorite varieties. Uh, it has a bunch of pictures on the back of different varieties cut in half, and it has names. I'm not going to sit there and read all of them, though. <laughs> so we're going to skip to the bottom. Uh, incredibly photographed and beautifully laid out. Epic Tomatoes will inspire and delight. Uh, that's from Nikki Jabor. Uh, when Craig recommends a variety, we listen. From Ira Wallace of Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. Craig LaHulier has been on a marathon journey with this fruit for 35 years. Growing and evaluating thousands of tomatoes, his hands-on knowledge is now entirely accessible in Epic Tomatoes. Uh, Diane Ott Wheatley, co-founder and vice president of Seed Savers Exchange. And then down below, Craig LaHulier is the tomato advisor for Seed Savers Exchange. Uh, he has trialed more than 1,200 varieties and included more than 100 varieties, or I'm sorry, 
introduced more than 100 varieties to the trade. He lives in Raleigh, North Carolina, which from the interview, you guys already know that. Uh, this book was put out by Story, America's Garden Publisher. Uh, it came out about for about 20 bucks, and I actually bought this new, so I paid that much. And quite frankly, it's worth it. Um, I actually, I was kind of surprised it was 20 bucks. I mean, good, solid, big book like this, you kind of expect those to be around the $40 range these days, but I was very pleasantly surprised. So, first off, I just want to say this book is full of really great photography. There is some illustration, but all that takes the form of historical illustrations from seed catalogs and stuff like that. So, there aren't a lot of drawings or illustrations of stuff to kind of explain things, but there are pretty detailed and good pictures, um, even when, like, some of the step-by-step -step stuff where he's talking about how to plant and grow tomatoes. So... Let's go to the chapters, since that seems to be the format I've settled on for how I'm going to do my interviews, <laughs> or interviews, for reviews. Ah, I've been mush mouth this whole episode. I do apologize if it's been a little stuttery or something. Um, I'm trying not to edit out all of my mistakes, because I feel like that encourages me to make fewer of them. So I'm really just trying to improve myself as a podcaster. Okay, so we have the preface, the introduction, uh, the origin of today's tomato, and that one he kind of goes over sort of the somewhat murky history um, because early on with a lot of the uh, growth by indigenous people, we actually don't know as much as we know about, say, the potato, right? We don't, we can't localize it to one specific group that domesticated at one time from one population of one species. We, we just sort of get this vague history of knowing these people knew about tomatoes and these people knew and so on. And then Europeans made contact and all that. Um, so it's a little, it's a little less rich of a history, but his origins then goes into its spread in Europe, and the bit I said at the beginning of the episode about the story about tomato being thought to be horribly poisonous, but actually probably just people didn't like them, a lot of that comes from here. Oh, one thing I can add to that, and I probably should have done that at the beginning, is there's also a story floating around that a big part of the whole poison myth was that they ate off a of pewter tableware, and the tomatoes would react with that and actually cause lead to leach into the food. I've seen this repeated in a lot of places. I have never, like, I've dug around, I've searched around, and I can't find a source for it anywhere. So, to the best of my knowledge, this is just an urban legend. Uh, so that's my addition to it. <laughs> uh, then he goes into the anatomy of a tomato, which gets into some pretty detailed stuff. There are a few things I think it kind of leaves out. It doesn't, um, if I'm remembering correctly, it doesn't talk about, like, the uh, jointed and jointless uh, flower stems. I could be wrong, though, because this it, he really does go pretty thoroughly. But what he does a really great job of is describing the nature of a tomato's color coming from a combination of the color of the flesh and the color of the skin. And so when we're talking about the Uluru ochre being a new and unique color, what they mean is it has the orange flesh with the semi-transparent but black in parts of skin because the black is only partially black, right? Only parts of the skin usually come out black. That's why you don't see a lot of pitch black tomatoes. There are a few, but most of them just have black around the shoulders. And the ochre is a unique combination of those two colors that you don't normally see. So this sets the ground for why that is so cool. <laughs> um, it also goes into a little bit of the diversity of tomatoes as far as different flavors, uh, the different growth habits, the, you know, the, the determinant, indeterminate, and dwarf. Um, and in our uh, interview. We also talked about semi-determinant, uh, which, as I understand it from what he just told me, and I could be wrong, I haven't listened to the whole thing and edited yet, so I haven't gone over it again. But semi-determinant tomatoes, it's just a catch-all for anything that doesn't really fit between determinant and indeterminant. So it can be a small determinant, I mean a small indeterminant or a large determinant, or anything that doesn't fit the mold of small indeterminant, big and indeterminate. Uh, the varieties mentioned as tree type those are the dwarfs he's talking about which dwarf is increasingly becoming the new term because of his project and then as he was talking the micro dwarf that refers to what was also sometimes called a dwarf determinant so he breaks that all down and clarifies that quite a bit um, then three is uh, planting and planting that covers uh, preparing for it, that sort of thing one thing about tomatoes is they do tend to have a lot of disease and um various pest susceptibilities so he talks about how if you're using containers you want to make sure you sanitize them if you're using the soil you want to make sure you mulch and use a clean mulch and you know check all that um, so a lot of good information there especially about containing 
your tomatoes as they grow, uh, especially important with indeterminate types that just keep growing. The next chapter is growing maintenance and care. That again covers maintaining and managing, uh, especially indeterminate growth. Five is harvest celebration. That is a list of various things you can do with your tomatoes, when to know if your tomato is ripe, that sort of thing. Six is saving for future. That's more specifically on seed saving. Seven, I'm going to get back to. Seven is breed your own tomatoes. That's an interesting one. We'll get back to that. Uh, eight is a QA. and a I believe that this may be a second or third edition of the book. I'm not exactly sure. Um, so I don't know if the Q&A was in the early one or if he did the Q&A process. And that was right at the beginning when he first published the book. But it's an old chapter of questions about tomatoes and tomato care and then his answers to them. Uh, nine, troubleshooting, diseases, pests, and air problems. That goes into a lot more of the diseases and stuff you can get with tomatoes. That's a lot of pictures of tomatoes suffering from various conditions to make it easier for you to identify. So that is a really handy chapter. That's one you'll actually, um, when I really, so when I started at my current job is also when I really seriously grew a bunch of tomatoes. Uh, I've always grown tomatoes, but it's always been like one or two plants, usually whatever happened to be at the hardware store at the beginning of the season. Um, I rarely grew from seed. And even though I, I looked at all these heirlooms and I thought they were so cool, I didn't do them a lot. Um, there was one year, several years ago, I bought a couple of uh, heirloom varieties. I believe it was Brandywine. And I grew those on and they were really nice, but that, that was the limit of it. I never continued on with those. So this is really the first couple of years here that I've really dug into growing tomatoes. And I have referenced this book a lot. Um, I... I when I've seen weird things like on the leaf or leaf shape, or I see a little Z spot or something, I'm immediately flicking through the pages here. Um, it's been a really handy resource for me. And then he has uh, 250 recommended tomatoes. That's a big list of the recommendations. Now, throughout the book, there are these big whole page descriptions like, uh, here we are, page 38. So uh, there are these big meet the varieties pages. And so like this one is Lillian's uh, Yellow Heirloom. And it has the yellow heirloom and red, uh, red Kansas paste that are both Lillian's varieties. And it's the whole story behind them, a little bit of a description of them, uh, what they're good for, that sort of thing. And you see this throughout the book. He has these, uh, f you know, a few pages on. He has the story of the Cherokee tomato, uh, Cherokee purple. I think there's the other Cherokee in here as well. Yep, Cherokee chocolate, Cherokee green. And you just keep going. He has the green giant, a bunch of others. So throughout the book, he has a lot of info on these recommended varieties and then he just has lists of them broken up by the type of tomato that sort of thing so you can see really what they are uh, then he has resources and sources he references a lot of sources for the where he got the information for the book so you can follow it up if you don't believe something or you just want to learn more about it um, he also has a lot of resources for learning a little more about tomatoes and that sort of thing so that that was handy as well i kind of went through quite a bit of that he has a glossary which breaks down a lot of the tomato specific terms which is very handy uh, acknowledgements and index. So there's a lot. Now, let's get back to the funnest chapter. Seven, breed your own tomatoes. Uh, in that, he he actually goes into a bunch of interesting breeding projects you can do. Um, First and foremost, when you're saving seed, you're breeding your plants. That's what you're doing. Even though you're trying to keep the variety consistent, your decisions over the years of which plants to save from, which not to save from, what plants you pull out earlier in the season, that sort of thing, as well as your environmental conditions, you know, your temperatures, pests, diseases, they're going to select plants. This is natural selection and uh, it, it weeds out the plants that will not survive in your environment. Then you have your own selection where you're picking the plants you want. So there's artificial selection, natural selection, both resulting in different plants over the years. So the Cherokee tomato, let's say I bought some Cherokee tomato seed from one of the uh, available sources right now. And I grew them here in Bakersfield. And I grew them for 10 years, right? Every year I'd plant a new crop. Maybe I'm doing a mi uh, mid-season crop that a lot of people do in hotter climates like mine, where you grow, uh, once you get those first tomatoes, you save some seed from those, and then you start other plants closer to the middle of the uh, summer so that you have some plants put in at the end of summer to go into fall. And this lets you get tomatoes here for a ridiculously long period of time without that slump you get in the middle of summer when the plants kind of slow down and die back a little bit. So if I did that for a few years, I would be selecting out the plants that are the best adapted for my conditions because everything that wasn't died before it produced fruit. And so if I'm saving, especially if I'm saving towards the end of the plant season, 
I'm saving the seeds from the plants that survive best in my environment. And that has a cumulative effect. Eventually, my Cherokee purple, or I'm sorry, my my Cherokee, uh, per, well, yeah. <laughs> Basically, my Cherokee tomato is going to be different than the Cherokee tomato I started with to a degree. That's going to happen no matter what you do if you're seed saving. But what this chapter covers is more about breeding your own varieties. So if you have a couple of varieties you like, you can cross them. You also suggest some ideas like if there's a hybrid you like, there's a process called dehybridization, which means you save seed from your hybrid. You grow out a bunch of them. And then you find the ones that look the most like the hybrid and you save those and you see if over a couple of generations you can get something close to hybrid and then you can cross back to the different, you can both cross them back to the original hybrid, but you can also cross them to each other to try and fix those traits you like in the hybrid. Um, and there are several projects where people try to do these. Sun Gold is a popular one for people to try and replicate because it's such a popular tomato, but it is a hybrid. Um, none of these have quite done it exactly. There are a few close ones. Also, when you're playing around with this or when you're playing around with dehybridization or any other breeding of tomatoes, it tends to produce a lot of offshoots that are different. So even if you don't get exactly what you're expecting or what you're trying to get, you might still get something very interesting. And so this chapter really delves into all these different little kind of projects you can do and stuff. And quite frankly, if you're growing tomatoes every year anyway, and you're doing this for a period of time, why not play around with breeding? You might create something you really like. You might even create something that goes on to be popular beyond you. And even if it's just some weird little tomato that only lives in your garden ever, and you have for several years and it dies out when you stop growing it, um, there was still something on this earth that was yours, right? That was your variety that nobody else had. So that's really just kind of cool. Um, so I think you can tell by my tone, I really like this book. Uh, he suggested in the interview that he's working on, he didn't suggest, he said, uh, he's planning on doing a dwarf tomato book eventually. I'm really looking forward to that. Especially if he makes a part of the focus of that, how to do your own breeding projects and what you can learn from his breeding project versus just a book on the dwarf varieties. I would still buy it either way. Um, a book on just dwarf tomato varieties would be very interesting, but if it gave me a little more meat on how to do this myself, that would be really interesting as well. So I'm keeping my eyes out for that. But yeah, Epic Tomatoes by Craig LaHillier. Definitely go pick it up, especially if you want to grow tomatoes. Um, it will dramatically improve your knowledge. Unfortunately, it will also result in you growing way too many tomatoes every year. Um, at my work garden, where I'm doing most of my gardening these days because I get paid to do it there, <laughs> I have, uh, I want to say, 10 or 12 tomato plants going. We lost a couple in the middle of summer and I have, I had before we had some issues with some of our other gardens and some of the other gardens we manage, I had other tomato plants there as well. So yeah, this will have you growing 20, 30 tomato plants at a go of various types and flavors and shapes and colors. But if you like tomatoes, I don't see that as a bad thing. <laughs> so definitely go pick it up. Thank you so much for listening. That wraps it up for this week. You can follow everything we're doing over at tjsgarden.com. And the best advertising we can get is word of mouth. So please share this show around with your friends uh, directly or via social media. Have a great day, guys, and enjoy your garden.